Welcome to Cambridge Forum, discussing Bob Dylan in America with historian and author Sean Wilentz. I'm Scott Alaric, folk singer, journalist, and author of Revival, a folk music novel, and I'll be your moderator. Fifty years ago, a young Minnesotan named Bob Zimmerman changed his name to Bob Dylan and traveled to New York to begin one of the most important, influential, and controversial careers in American music, and to redefine the idea of what a song could be. But while he presented himself as the most individual and idiosyncratic of artists, perhaps no American songwriter was more profoundly shaped by the cultural landscape from which he grew and by the times into which he poured his genius. In his latest book, Bob Dylan in America, our speaker, Sean Wilentz, brings together the skills of an eminent historian and the passion of an ardent fan to trace Dylan's voyage through the American musical culture and the enormous impact he's had upon it. Written with unprecedented access to studio tapes, notes, and photos, this critically acclaimed biography explores the complete arc of Dylan's artistic development. How is he the product of the cultural influences that shaped him? How has he influenced that culture? Why has he remained so relevant? What does the enduring legend of Bob Dylan say about us? Sean Wilentz is the George Henry Davis 1886 Professor of American History at Princeton University, author of The Rise of American Democracy, which received the coveted Bancroft Award, and most recently, of The Age of Reagan. The historian in residence for Bob Dylan's official website, for which I hope you get hazard pay, <laughs> He has also received a Deems Taylor Award for Musical Commentary and a Grammy nomination for his liner notes to Bootleg Series Volume 6, Bob Dylan Live 1964, the concert at Philharmonic Hall. Welcome to Cambridge Forum, Sean Wilentz. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Scott, for that lovely introduction. Thank you, Pat. It's a uh, it's a privilege and an honor to, and a delight to be back here at the Cambridge Forum. It's been a number of years, and I kept on writing, and I got to come back, which really makes me very happy. Um, I'm not sure what, how Bob Dylan connects with, exactly with the theme of how we live today, um, except that we're still listening to Bob Dylan. Um, but we always listen to Bob Dylan differently, I think, and I think the very fact that a, a whole new generation, actually, of, of people, um, listeners, has come to his music tells you something about his timelessness. Um, most of the things about how we live today have to do with recent events. Um, much of Dylan's music still speaks to us, some of it very, very old indeed. At any rate, I'm not going to talk for a whole long time. I, I'd rather get into a conversation with, with you all, but um, a few remarks just to start. One of the things about Bob Dylan that is kind of a perennial, if not a constant, is that he always gets under people's skin. And he's done it again. Um, none of those of you who have been reading the New York Times recently have, may have noticed um, a bit of a brouhaha, tiny one, about his paintings that have been uh, an exhibition at the uh, Gagosian Gallery in New York. The exhibition just ended. There were also the hue and cry that um, some of those paintings look, look an awful lot like photographs, um, including one that was done by Henri Cartier-Bresson. I, I knew that some of you might have that on, on, on your minds, um, and I was prepared to talk about that. And up until about two weeks ago, uh, my, my standard answer to this, this has been that, that Dylan, although Dylan has been drawing and scribbling and painting for many years, many, many years now, um, that his paintings actually mean about as much to me as, say, Herman Melville's sculptures or, or Anton Chekhov's operas. Then, though, I went and actually saw them, and they were pretty good. Um, so I was much more <laughs> impressed with the paintings. Um, but I'll get to all that later on. Um, the controversy still reminds me, again, of how much Bob Dylan does get under people's skin. Um, as I've discovered a bit, writings about Bob Dylan get, get under people's skin, too. Um, many think of him as an overrated master of hype, 
Many think of him as an ordinary talent who's gotten away with murder, um, but many more think of him as the most important songwriter, uh, certainly of, of our time, perhaps of, of, of the last century, could to come out of the United States. There is this tendency, though, to try and show that the icon has feet of clay, and that's part of what's going on these days, too, I think. Um, but we can talk about that later. A few remarks about why I wrote this book, why it's here, why I'm back at the Cambridge Forum. I mean, another book about Bob Dylan? Do we really need another? I mean, you know, there's been lots of very good, fine books written about Bob Dylan. Um, after Clinton Halen, after Greal Marcus, on, in, in several books, Greal has written uh, about, about Dylan very well, extraordinarily well. Christopher Ricks, what more can be said? about Bob Dylan. We know so much about him. And at the same time, we know so little about him. But it may be an impossible task. So why did I do this? Well, in part, it was for personal reasons, um, and in part, intellectual reasons. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how they were entwined um, in bringing me to write this thing and, and how it all came out. The personal has to do with my growing up. Um, and on uh, rereading the book, actually, myself, as I had to do a little while back for a class, um, it has a lot to do with my father, actually, um, and with his brother, who ran the 8th Street Bookshop, a very famous bookshop in New York City through the 1950s, 1960s, and 1970s. Um, the bookshop was on the corner, it was in Greenwich Village, it was on the corner of 8th Street and McDougal, and um, it was kind of a literary hub at that time, um, it's sort of um, those of you who wouldn't know the, the, the book scene from the 50s and 60s, um, it was to New York something what City Lights Books was to San Francisco. It was kind of a, a beat center. The beat poets sold their poetry there very early on. And it continued to be a literary hub um, for downtown and, for that matter, midtown and uptown um, intellectual life all through literary life through the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Also. Uh, it being at the corner of 8th and McDougal, it was just down the street or up the street, depending on how you look at it, from where the folk revival was really happening in New York. Um, all of the cafes, or many of the cafes, with the exception of Gertie's Folk City, which was over on, Third street, uh, over on 4th Street in Mercer. But, um, um, you know, the, the, the Gaslight, the, the Bitter End, the Cafe Wa, all of these places where Dylan and his friends um, were getting going in the early 1960s, they were just down the block. Um, places like the Folklore Center, run by my dad's friend Izzy Young. Um, so I grew up in all of that. It was an extremely odd childhood, to say the least. Uh, the problem was I thought it was all quite normal growing up amidst all of that. Um, you know, and it was, it was strange. I mean, in, you know, in 1964, my father gave me tickets to a Bob Dylan concert. I was 13 years old. My father gave me my first copy of Blonde on Blonde. Um, I was a kid. This is strange to be coming from your father. How do you rebel from all of that? And my standard answer to that is I rebelled by becoming a Princeton history professor, about as staid as you can get. I grew up in all of that, and like I suspect many of you here, um, was you know, a, a big Bob Dylan fan growing up, listened to all his records, bought all his records as soon as they came out, listened to them endlessly, scratched them like hell. Um, you know, I, I, I still have my copy of Bringing It All Back Home, but it does not play on any record player known to man because it's been scratched up so much. Um, part of it was just because I wanted to hear, understand what the words meant, and if you wanted to understand those lyrics, you had to listen to it again and again and again and again and again, and I wasn't quite so careful with the old needle. Um, but for a long time, I actually wasn't involved with Bob Dylan's music. Um, around about the middle of the 80s, I kind of stopped listening to him seriously, um, in part because of what he was doing. I think that was a low point in his, in his output, in part because I had other things to think about besides you know, music, let alone Bob Dylan. Um, but only came back to him later, um, in the early 1990s, um, with a story that I'm going to tell you about. Um, and went to a concert, a former friend took me to Wolf Trap to a concert there in Virginia. Um, and then I wrote a review of that, and then I was contacted to write the, the liner notes on the web for, for Love and Theft, an album that came out in 2001, and the rest sort of continued. 
and I wrote a lot about Dylan for his website and others. Um, and this book kind of got born out of all of that. So those are the personal reasons. The intellectual reasons concern how I, to try and figure out, or, or rather, to, to reflect on how deeply immersed Dylan is in the width and breadth of American culture, as Scott was talking about. Um, we think of Bob Dylan as a, a folky from the early 60s who was you know, playing um, um, folk songs, some of which he learned right here you know, at, in, in, at Harvard, Baby Let Me Follow You Down. Um, but old folk songs and then turning them into protest songs and then throwing it all overboard and becoming a rock singer in the mid-1960s, from, from whence he developed. That's kind of the standard story about him. And it all began with Woody Guthrie, and it all began with him being a Woody Guthrie jukebox, and he took off from there. But in fact, Dylan's immersion in American culture and his use of American culture has been much deeper than all that, and it has been all along. Um, I, to be sure, he's learned a lot along the way. Um, but he being the sponge that he is, he, he, he remembers everything and forgets nothing and puts it all to use. Um, never, nothing is wasted on, on him as an artist. Um, it all shows up somewhere, all of it that he thinks is good. Um, I wrote somewhere, uh, reflecting on love and theft, which is about minstrelsy in part, but also that he's an artist who you know, steals what he loves and then loves what he steals by turning it into something of his own, as all great artists do. But that immersion has involved far more than the world, than the, than the music of Woody Guthrie, or for that matter of Little Richard, or for that matter of the rhythm and blues that we know um, um, that, that he imitates in some ways or reproduces. It involves polka tunes that he was hearing as a kid in um, uh, the, the Iron Range of Minnesota. It involves Bing Crosby, it involves Frank Sinatra, it involves, literarily, it involves not just Herman Melville, but Ovid, it involves Plutarch, it involves Juvenile, it involves lots of, lots and lots of things, let alone the Bible. Dylan was once asked, um, I think by the, the, the Times Literary Supplement, um, to, to answer two questions. What's the most overrated book ever uh, produced and what's the most underrated book ever produced? And he had the same answer, both, the Bible. It's both the most overrated and the most underrated. So the book, I, I divided into five parts. Um, the first, you know, talking about origins and influences, early influences. Um, I wanted to try and get at the, the, the um, two, two elements in particular. Um, try to get at the, the world of the popular front folk revival of the 1930s and 1940s, of which Woody Guthrie and Pete Seeger were so important. Um, but I wanted to do it without telling the same boring old, not, not so boring, but still old stories, stale stories about Bob Dylan and Woody Guthrie. You know, Bob Dylan comes to New York, he gets out to the hospital, he sees his dying hero and writes song to Woody and the next thing you know, there we are. I, wa I didn't want to tell that story yet again. It's been told a lot, it's been told a lot of different ways, best by him himself, in fact, in his memoir, Chronicles, Volume 1. So I chose to look at a figure or to examine closely a figure who was actually very much a part of that world, and we can talk about that as well, but seems to be completely offbeat as far as Bob Dylan's concerned, and that is Aaron Copeland. The, the Aaron Copeland-Bob Dylan connection um, um, struck me as one that deserved some um, unraveling, in part because I discovered early on just how close um, Copeland was with Pete Seeger's father, Charlie Seeger. Um, but it gets at a certain world that was coming out in the 30s and 40s, and uh, while, while Dylan was, you know, before Dylan was born, but that then, then influenced him tremendously in the 1950s. The second influence was a lot easier. Um, um, it was the influence of the Beats, um, particularly Allen Ginsberg, with whom he forged a friendship. Um, that was personal too, though, because they actually met in my uncle's apartment in the village. Um, Having done the, 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 um, the early stuff then, I'd moved on to see his work in various periods. Um, there's, a, uh, there's, a, there's a section called Early, which covers a concert in 1966 and another, The Making of Bond Bron in 1966. So, uh, sorry, a concert in 64, and then The Making of Bond on Bond in 66, and then goes on to a number of different moments right up to our own period, our own time. One of the... Um, turning points in the book 
is a section that I've called Interlude. It comes um, at the early beginning of the 1990s, trying to talk about his work there. Those of you who are Dylan fans will remember, um, the 80s were a difficult time for him. He was not doing his best work. Um, he did do one album, Oh Mercy, um, that came out in 89 that was you know, seized upon by Dylan fans as, ah, finally he's back. Um, but then th the next album wasn't terribly well received. Um, but then in 1992 and 1993, he releases two albums that were recorded in his garage in, in Malibu um, of old traditional folk songs. Nothing but covers, nothing but old songs by the likes of Blind Willie McTell and the Mississippi Sheiks and um, um, Doc Watson and others. Um, and I think that that was a turning point in his, in his, um, in, 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 in his, in his output, in his career, in his art. It was at that point, I think, that a somewhat um, disoriented Bob Dylan um, got back in touch with his muse. Um, and that is, those albums are not among the best sellers or best known of, of Dylan's work, but they're among my favorites um, for a lot of different reasons, uh, which actually I'll, I'll read a bit from that and, and, and it'll get back to the personal as well and you'll get a sense of uh, you know, how much this book actually meant to me to write. These two albums, um, the second one is called World Gone Wrong. Um, it's contained, as I said, a number of, of, of different kinds of blues and traditional music. The last song on that album is a song called Lone Pilgrim, um, which is actually taken from a, a rendition that Doc Watson did in the very early 60s. Um, but it's, it's, from, it's, 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 it's a hymn that comes out of the sacred harp. How many of you know here, how many of you here know what the sacred harp was or what the sacred harp is? It's very much alive. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, there's one person. The sacred harp is, as you know, the most venerable hymnal in American history, right? Um, it's a collection of hymns that, that those of us, I actually take part in this sometimes myself, who sing shape note music, um, fa sol la music it's sometimes called, um, music that was actually born here in Boston and Cambridge at the very beginning of the 18th century, but then moved south um, and was codified in a couple of very important um, um, collections of hymns um, but the most important of which was the Sacred Harp, um, which was said to be, apart from the Holy Bible, the most common book in both Union and Confederate war camps, battle camps during the Civil War. Um, it was that well known, um, coming off of the religious enthusiasms of the 1830s, 40s, and 50s. So it's an extraordinary song, um, and, and Dylan sings it extremely well. It's a song about um, a pilgrim um, who goes to the tomb of another person, and, and, and the, the to, at, at the tomb, he can actually hear of the voice of the departed person. The, the departed person, in fact, was, a, was, was the pilgrim himself, but that's another story. He hears the voice, and the voice tells him, it's, it's, a, it's a voice of, of comfort, telling him, you know, we, don't weep for me now, I am gone, but I'm in a better place, and um, tell my children, tell my wife not to weep for me at all, that I have gone home to the master. It's a very simple song. But Dylan inhabits it extraordinarily. Um, he sings it extremely well, and I describe all of that um, in, in the book, or I do the best I can. But I wanted to conclude, I'll read a bit about what that song, what I think that song actually means, and then we'll, we'll open it up for discussion, or his singing of the song. Coming at the conclusion of an album of old ballads and blues about strange happenings, about men no longer able to do their women right because the, because the world is going wrong, about rounders, gamblers, six-gun shooters, a blue-eyed, blue-bellied Boston boy cut down by Johnny Reb, and more. Lone Pilgrim is a reprieve, a coming to rest, a ghost note of a different order, and it is also a benediction. Dylan had found a new use for a fa so la standard from the Sacred Harp, a song inspired by a godly, white-robed minister of charity, decency, and redemption, and a compiler of hymns, that's the man who was buried, in an America over, uh, convulsed by religious awakenings. The song, as he describes and performs it, might even have been a gloss on one of the white pilgrim's poems. Let me arise above the fame of riches and renown, above an earthly monarch's name to an immortal crown. 
I heard Dylan first sing this song as my father was lying. My father fell ill in 1994, and he died the next year. And it was actually that moment that got me back into Bob Dylan. And hearing Dylan sing Lone Pilgrim when my father fell ill in 1994, and then listening again over and over during the months after he died, brought a solace that came from the last place and from the last performer I'd ever have expected it from. More than a decade later, it still brings solace, especially in the last two lines and the very last word, which is also the last word on the album, World Gone Wrong. Quote, the same hand that led me through scenes most severe has kindly assisted me home. For that performance of a song that few except Dylan's most passionate fans remember, I will always feel a gratitude that is completely personal. But all of that aside, it is clear that with Lone Pilgrim and World Gone Wrong, Dylan had reached the end of the beginning of his own artistic reawakening and, assisted by the kind master, had reached a place that at least felt more like home. So after that, I talk about Dylan's renaissance in the 1990s on through his albums Love and Theft and uh, Modern Times, right up to the Christmas album, which I actually defend. Yes, I think the Christmas album's kind of cool. Um, um, and, and then I have a, a, an epilogue um, which takes up the, the controversy. I got, I got involved in a, a bit of a controversy with um, some writers, some pundits, about Bob Dylan's appearance in China, um, which people took exception to thinking that he had, he, was, he, he had wanted to sing The Times They Are Changed and the Chinese wouldn't let him, and so he just, just refused to do it, which is, in fact, balderdash. It's not what happened. Um, and, and reflecting a little bit about art and politics. And then we can, um, coming right up to today with the, uh, the, 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 the accusations that he's a plagiarist, um, yet again. Um, we can talk about all of that. Um, I've become kind of Bob Dylan's defender. I, I don't know why um, I, I have this job. Um, it's, it's kind of a lonely job, um, but I guess somebody has to do it. Um, um, it's because, in fact, I mean, look, he's not going to defend himself from this stuff, so he shouldn't have to. Um, you know, he's above all of that. And the artist never has to defend himself. And I'm not here to do that only. Um, I'm here to appreciate his work. But I think that, in fact, working through some of the questions about um, appropriation, reappropriation, we actually get to the heart of what Bob Dylan's art is all about. Um, you know, if you think it's plagiarism, you're confusing art with a term paper. Um, he's not writing term papers, he's creating art, and his form of doing so involves um, an immersion in American culture, American literature, and not just American, which is extraordinarily deep and extraordinarily rich, and which he raises to an entirely different level. And that really is his secret having revealed, gosh, what I think Bob Dylan's secret is, I think I should turn it over to you guys. And thank you very much. So should I stand here and, and sure. just I'm converse? Just, I'm actually going to do a little reading. Oh, okay. Uh, before we start the questions, um, I, I wanted to do just a brief uh, reading from my novel. It's a novel set in the modern... Cambridge folk scene because I think it picks up on Sean's defense of uh, of Dylan a little bit I, uh, about his you know is he a plagiarist or is he simply part of the ongoing folk process uh, I tried to throw I'm sure if Sean ever writes a novel he, he he also won't be able to resist tossing in some of his favorite true stories and I couldn't do th I couldn't do that but I think this really picks up on Dylan's roots in folk tradition matter a lot to the way he ignites his muse, to where he finds his ideas, and to the chameleonic way that he absorbs influences and turns them into something new. In the days of traditional music, we called these variants, and we applauded them. And, and it, it, it makes it very difficult to try to proscribe or criticize the boundaries in Dylan's music that keep shifting. Nathan wanted to show that one way traditional songs differ from modern ones is that they changed as they traveled and were sung by new singers, new generations, new cultures. A traditional song could have dozens, hundreds, even thousands of variations. The folklorists call them variants. And songs became magically melded over the years. 
There were bits of an Irish ballad in an American cowboy lament, traces of a German hymn in a Tex-Mex love song, an African-American field holler embedded in the chorus of a New England sea shanty. How did they travel so far? Who changed them and why? Or could it have happened on its own, the same lonesome couplet created by two different lovelorn lovers sitting on two different lonely shores longing for two different distant loves, the same sweaty hard luck lyrics imagined by a slave toiling in somebody else's field and by a poor sailor hauling away on somebody else's bowline. We can never know and Nathan found the wonder of that intoxicating. He knew some stories that showed how the old ways carried over into modern times. He'd heard one about Sarah Makem, the mother of Irish singer Tommy Makem, who became famous with the Clancy Brothers, the hugely popular Irish folk group of the 1960s. Tommy's mother was a renowned source singer. That's a term folklorists use to describe someone who knows a lot of traditional songs and came to them in traditional ways through the commonly held repertoire of family, community, faith, or occupation. Young folklore students often came to the Makem door hoping to record her songs. Sarah Makem was always happy to sing for people, so she'd invite them in, make them a nice pot of tea and a plate of cookies, then sing them whatever came to mind. More than once, young Tommy would watch a student go bug-eyed and begin to scribble furiously in his notebook because Mrs. Makem was singing something that didn't appear in any of the traditional collections he'd studied. Could this be a new folk song, something no one had collected before? What a rare feather in the student's cap. To a folklorist, this was the equivalent of an astronomer discovering a new star. The student would thank Mrs. Makem profusely and scurry out the door, eager to get the song documented before anyone else did. While his mother talked about what a nice young man that was, but in such a hurry, aren't they all these days? Young Tommy would run after him. I'm sorry to have to tell you this, he'd say, but Mum learned that song off the radio last week. Perry Como sang it, I think. See, she doesn't care a damn where they come from. If she likes them, she sings them. Nathan loved that story. It showed how futile it is to try to categorize traditional music to chart its travels or ever-changing sound. It's like trying to pin a butterfly that's still in flight. Tradition is a living thing, Nathan believed that utterly. It's a force of nature, a river still running, its current denying our attempts to freeze it in time, file it away, fix its origin or destination. Thank you. I'm Scott Alaric, moderating uh, the Sean Wilentz discussion on Bob Dylan in America. And uh, I have some questions here. Whoops. Whoops. Um, first of all, let's get uh, thank you, Sean Wilentz, for that. Uh, as as someone who, I've, I've interviewed, Sean, a, l a lot of people who knew Dylan back in the early years, and I get this sense that while they tend to almost anthemically call him Bobby, it's a way that people in the early 60s kind of say they knew him when, by saying Bobby this and Bobby that, but I, I've gotten a strong sense from every one of them that I've interviewed, even Joan Baez and Dave Van Ronk, who were very close to him, that none of them really knew him very well. I mean, even Joan, who had an affair with him for a long time, um, I've gotten the sense that there's, that there's a real distance between him and even the people that he spent all of his life with back then. And I'm wondering if you've sensed that same thing from people you've interviewed about Bob Dylan and in the remarkable way you've immersed yourself in the work of Bob Dylan, his culture, his life, and times, if you felt like you've gotten to know the man behind the myth at all. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, there, yeah, I mean, there is this way in which people want to um, be very close to him, um, ha have a, um, well, I mean, he was known as Bobby as, a, as you know, in Cambridge days, in the old days, um, in, in New York. Um, so that was how people knew him. But there is this, um, pe people think they're closer to him than they can possibly be. And if they really know him, they realize that. Um, 
Um, Joan Baez, in fact, says this in that in, in the movie, right? In, in 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 Scorsese's movie, you know, he just says she says, "I don't know, I don't know, I don't, I, I don't know what the hell, you know." It's she not you know several profanities then follow um, about, about her, her 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 lack of understanding of this guy who was his, her boyfriend for a while. Um, and let's see, I mean, people around him. I did talk to I, one thing I didn't want to do is I didn't want to interview him for this book. Um, in part because, um, A, I, what was I going to ask him? You know, did you really sing this on such a day? Or, you know, there wasn't anything I really wanted to find out. I wanted to do this on my own. It wasn't that kind of book. You know, it was a book about my readings of his work rather than my, uh, my, my reading of him or my understanding of him. Also, I mean, he is so charismatic that, you know, you just get sucked in. Um, I mean, forget about it. Um, um, and, and, you know, those blue two, those two robin's egg blue eyes, I mean, forget about it. You're going to be uh, done. I would be done. Um, so, but I did get to know him better. I got to know his work better. I don't know that I, people ask me if I know Bob Dylan. My standard response is nobody knows Bob Dylan, uh, which I think is true. Uh, or very few people know him really well. I think his family knows him and his kids know him. I think it's his loved ones know him. But um, um, he's a very hard guy to know um, um, because he's so mercurial, because he's so private. So I, I set out to, know, to, to understand more about his work. And I think insofar as you can know more about an artist through his art, I think I did manage to do that. Um, but just to be constant, I mean, it's, it's just like peeling an onion. I mean, you come to one layer, and then there's another layer, and another layer, and another layer. And I, I, I can't get to the, I haven't gotten to the bottom of it. But I do think I know more. I certainly had learned more um, um, by the time I finished than when I began. Uh, I'll ask one more question then, and then turn it over to the people in the audience for a question. But the, um, as someone like me, I've spent my life in folk music. And as a result, I've always been intrigued and troubled by the controversy around Dylan's electric appearance at the Newport Folk Festival in 1965 and the stunning contradictions between the popular legend that he was booed off the stage and the archival evidence that he was brought back for two, on, two enthusiastic encores and that he did every song that he came to do. Um, what does your research say happened at Newport in 1965? And I, I'm even more curious, as a cultural historian, why do you think that story has become so iconic in American music? It's become iconic because a lot of uh, it, w it was a moment. You know, he did something that was, as he himself said, he did a crazy thing. I mean, he did a work. He'd done the workshops. He 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 performed. You know, earlier in in, in the, at Newport, the, the, the you know crowded workshops. Then he comes out for his nighttime thing, and um, a lot of people wanted to see the acoustic Bob Dylan, and a lot of people were listening to the radio. And the people listening to the radio had been listening to like a Rolling Stone, which was already zooming up to number two. So there were a lot of people in the audience who knew exactly what to expect. Um, but there were different camps there. And there, was, there, were, there were lots of camps within the folk establishment, within the folk world. I mean, there were the performers, the younger people, like Peter Yarrow and others who were his age, who were his buddies. But then there was the old guard. I mean, there was Theo Pakel, and there was you know, Seeger and, and, uh, and those guys. And they didn't really like this. Um, um, Pete has actually, Pete Seeger has said, Subsequently, it was just that it was too loud and the distortion was too great. But there were letters from him in the same, from the old days that it turned up that he, he just really didn't like this. Because it was, you know, what? It was, he was supposed to be Woody Guthrie, and he ends up becoming, a, you know, Little Richard. That's not what they planned on. Um, and he wasn't Little Richard. I mean, if you listen to that music, and, and Scott's absolutely right. I mean, the, the idea that he was booed off the stage, there was some booing, but there was a lot of cheering as well. Um, or there's a lot of people who were just knocked out by it or didn't know what to make of it, but they were willing to give him a chance because they admired him so much. So if you listen to the tapes, and then, and then as you go through the tapes from that whole period, from after, you know, this was in July, late July 65, he comes to Newport, he does his thing. But then he gives concerts after that in, at the end of 65. He goes out to LA, there's no booing at all. Everybody loves it. He goes to Hartford, Connecticut, and on the tape, you can one guy saying, you know, um, play folk music. But everybody else is having a great time. You know, they're cheering. They love it. They think it's terrific. Um, 
When he gets to England, it's more organized because there the folk music movement was much more tied in with politics. I mean, with, with the Communist Party, for, to, to be blunt about it. And kids were organized, young people were organized to go and boo as a political statement. And, and that was you know, quite purposeful. Um, and, and, and it had overlays to some of what was going on here. The Forest Hill near Riot in New York. If you go to New York, um, you know, you're going to get booed because there are a lot of, you know, young red diaper babies who are going to expect you to be Woody Guthrie, and you're not. However, he then gave a concert in New York at Carnegie Hall in December, and he was cheered. And even he couldn't, you know, he comes out and he says, I didn't expect, think you'd, you'd think that way. And he was kind of taken aback by it. So, um, so that moment was complicated. Um, it was complicated in American culture, too. It was 1965. The, the country was about to, to, to come apart at the seams in all kinds of ways. Um, and I think that Dylan's um, um, appearance there was part of that. I mean, 1965, think of what's going on in that one year. Um, it's, it's the year that Malcolm X gets, gets killed. It's the year that, uh, of Watts. It's the year of Selma. It's the year of so much that's going on in politics. It's the year when the Vietnam War really gets ramped up. A lot is going on, and the country's about to have a nervous breakdown. And there's, <laughs> and there's Bob Dylan. You know, singing I Ain't Gonna Work on Maggie's Farm No More. Which, you know, if you knew anything about, uh, knew enough about folk music, you know that that was just another folk song. You know, it's, it's just, you know, the, the, it's, it, he's not gonna work, you know. He'd, he'd already taken the word, it's, it's a song called Down on Penny's Farm, which he had taken the, 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 the music to and turned into Hard Times in New York Town back in 1961, 62. But then he takes the lyrics and he turns it into Maggie's Farm. Which is, you know, and, and he updates it. And it's all about, you know, I'm not going to do what you tell me to do. Now, you know, this was done in a very, very powerful way, but again, it gets into the, to, the, to the mixtures of things. Lots of people didn't hear what Dylan was doing. Dylan was so far ahead of everyone else. He was at least six months to a year in front of, the, in front of everybody else at a time when the country's having a nervous breakdown. That's quite a moment. And Newport was, was a kind of, you know, the moment, because it was the first time that he, hit the, that he hit a stage. He had already been recording, but the first time he hit a stage, you know, with a telecast, with a, with a, you know, a Fender Telecaster. And that really was boom. Anybody, was anybody there? What did you think? Could you come, come up to the mic, mic, please? One thing uh, you have to remember about the 1965 uh, Newport Folk Festival, there were, were a couple of other um, amplified bands there. Yes. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't the only one who did that. Um, the band was fairly ragged in, in, the, two, in the three rock numbers that he did. Um, and, and I agree with what you said earlier. I think the crowd was, was mixed. I think there were those who came to a folk festival and wanted to see folk mu right. listen to folk music. Mm -hmm. And Dylan came out mm -hmm. with a pretty raucous rock and roll sound. Mm -hmm. um, but as you said, you know, there, there were already subterranean homesick blues had come out, uh, ro like Rolling Stone had come out. People mm -hmm. knew what he was doing. Right, right. Um, I was young, so I really liked it. Some of the old people didn't. Right. Um, I think there were also some people who felt that it would have been okay if it wasn't at a folk festival. Right. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, I remember it well, and I do have the tape, so I've listened to it quite a few times since uh -huh, then. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah, and I think that uh, there was also a, there was a more profound um, disagreement about his artistic direction. I, I think that there were many folkies back then who said it wasn't about the instrumentation; it was about, and this was a phrase that I, I've heard several people use: "He's writing me songs, not we songs." Which gets back to, to, to the idea that Sean was advancing, that there were a lot of people who sort of felt like they had adopted him as the, as the next great red songwriter. Right. I, I just want to add one other point, too. I went to Forest Hills, which I think was only a month or so two. I was there, too. Afterwards. Yeah, it's a little later. There was a lot more booing at Forest oh, yeah. Hills, even though by that point he was doing sort of half, a, half an acoustic concert and half an right. electric concert. Now, Forest Hills was almost a riot. I mean, it was, it was, but people were coming there to cause a riot, I think. Yeah. You know, it was pretty clear. There's one other thing I want, um, um, but what was that stuff? Well, never mind. Go ahead. Let's, yeah. let's Are you listening down. to Sean Wilentz discussing Bob Dylan in America? Now, let's take some questions from the audience. Please come forward and line up at the microphone, and please limit yourself to one well-phrased question to allow as many people as possible to speak. Yeah, remember, there'll be people listening at home, too. So, 
Uh, you said you're a defender of Dylan, so I challenge you to defend Mastin Anonymous. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> but then I have another I question. I love to defend Mastin Anonymous. That's uh, my favorite. Well, I'll listen to that, then I have another question, serious one. But yeah. you, you really do? Yeah. Um, you okay. have to read the book, though. I have, a whole def I, I have a whole description of Mastin Anonymous, which runs against the common view that it's, a, you know, it's just a piece of junk. Uh, or, or a, a vanity vehicle for a, for a star who gets a lot of other stars around him, and then he's the worst actor of all time. He's not a great actor, but um, I think there's a lot more to the movie than, than people have, have allowed, so, but go ahead. There, there's a book there, too? Huh? There's a book? No, it's in my book. Oh, in your book, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I read the book and I loved it, but I hadn't seen, so I lost that. You but, must have um, missed that. <laughs> yeah, no, but I, I'd love, I want to thank you for, the, the book uh, thank turned you. me on thank to you red, very much. Under Red Sky, I think you mentioned favorably, and I, was blown away by that. Um, but I want to ask you if you know anything about when he's planning to come out with the follow-up to Chronicles, which I just love. Oh. And talk about Chronicles maybe a bit, but what, what you know about what he's thinking about writing? Right, I don't know much. I mean, I don't know that it's, it's gonna be anytime soon. Um, and he, he, he signed a contract, so I know that, but you know, contracts and books are two different things. Um, no, I think Chron Chronicles is, a, is an extraordinary piece of work, again. I mean, he wrote it on the back of buses. He wrote it while he was on tour. Um, and, um, you know, it's a simple, eloquent book of gratitude. I mean, here's this guy that everybody thinks of as a, you know, hard-nosed, you know, screw you, all of those interviews from the, you know, mid-60s, a kind of brash, arrogant guy. Um, he comes across in the book as extraordinarily appreciative and interested in, in, in kind of interrogating himself about where things came from. Um, he talks about going up to the New York Public Library. In any historian, this is a, you know, it makes the heart melt, right? He went up and read microfilm in the New York Public Library to learn more about the Civil War era of the 1850s. Um, I suspect that's one of the things in the book that's actually true. And um, um, so I think it's, that as a, as a buildings roman, as it were, because it's mostly about, the best chapters I think are about him as a, as a young person. Uh, I think it's very, it's, you know, it's one of the best modern American memoirs, I think. So I like it a lot. Um, but again, it's, ad, it's, 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 its tone of gratitude, I think, of graciousness, is um, it's heartfelt, and 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 um, he's gracious. He's he's grateful to an entire culture, really, but to particular individuals, you know, especially. So, yeah, yeah. You were talking about how some people say they really don't know Bob Dylan very well. It reminded me uh, his first girlfriend when he came to New York, Suze Rotolo, was interviewed on NPR about a half year ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, she said something which was kind of interesting. She said that he never even told her that Bob Dylan wasn't his, uh, his real name. I mean, until she found out accidentally when his wallet spilled out on yeah. the floor. He found his draft card. Yeah, and right. I thought that was kind of revealing that you know he wouldn't even tell it. You know, didn't even let his persona right. down to his own girlfriend. It was right. kind of right. Yeah, she took his initials. She used to call him Raz because his initials were Robert Allen Zimmerman. So he called she, you know. Um, yeah, well, he's, a, you know, masked and anonymous. You know, he's a, he's a masked man. He's not the Lone Ranger, but he's a, he, he, he is a guy who exists not just artistically, but personally behind a lot of different persona, a lot of different masks, some of them, you know, all of them of his own making. Um, um, so, you know, he is elusive, but he's elusive not just to the audiences, but he's elusive to his own friends, to his own girlfriend. So, I mean, I think a lot probably goes into that story. Um, you're, you're different when you're 20 than when you're 60, or when you're 70, as he is now. Um, so he may have, you know, had other things going on. One does, um, and one wants to be something that one is not, but yet wants to, one has great ambitions. Um, to become something, so you make the stuff up about yourself. But um, um, but but they, but they became real those those poses. So um, you know he, he's always you know the, in the sixty at the sixty four concert right. Um, there's this one moment where he says um, he had just sung Gates of Eden I think, which had blown. I was at that concert, it blew people away. I mean no one knew what to make of it. It was so amazing, and he says something like, "Don't let that scare you. It's just Halloween. It happened to be Halloween night." I've got my Bob Dylan mask on. A masquerading, he says, with a kind of, kind of a stoned laugh, <laughs> basically. Um, but he's aware of all that, you know. But then again, that goes back to the Greeks. So, yes, Rick. 
Sean, when I first uh, saw your book, in the, the, the Coop, uh, and I paged through it, I looked for two things. One was the honorary degree that Bob Dylan got at Princeton, and the Day of the Locust, which he wrote right. about that. Right. And the other was any connections with Bruce Springsteen, right. and there are two mentions in the book right. at a, a Yale concert, or a New Haven concert, and then right. uh, one of the songs that he suggested Dylan sort of followed from Springsteen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'd be interested in your comment about you know, both of those and the pertinence. There's sort of right. a New Jersey connection to both of them. <laughs> right, and Princeton, our, 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 our common institution. Um, well, I don't know the whole story about why he went down to that, why he decided to say yes. I mean, the extraordinary thing is that he said yes when Princeton asked him to come down to, give an, uh, to get an honorary degree. Um, but he decided to go down and, 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 and do it. He'd never graduated college. Um, he'd never gotten past the first semester of freshman year at the University of Minnesota. So here's, you know, August Princeton University about, and wants to give him a degree, and he says yes, and he goes down. But he's very nervous, and he's very uptight, and he's wearing a suit, which he didn't want to, he didn't want to, um, he didn't want, he didn't wear a hood. He didn't want the hood. Um, he's willing to put on the robes, but only when he was coaxed to do so. Um, but um, he went up, he was kind of nervous, and then, the, uh, uh, the provost of the university, who would later become actually the president of Harvard, and a, a dear friend of mine, um, read the, the usual inscription and comium that is read when you get a, you know, an honorary degree just saying you know, why, why you're getting the honorary degree. And it said, this is Bob Dylan, and he's amazing, and he's great, and he's the voice of a generation. At which point, yikes! You know, I mean, people have been putting that weight on him forever. You know, um, um, voice of a generation the Messiah, the this, the that. And he didn't want to have anything to do with it. So that made him all the more uptight. So he wrote, he went home and he wrote this song, Day of the Locusts. Um, um, I happen to know he did not go to the Black Hills of Dakota, though. He went back on the Jersey Turnpike and went to the city. Because somebody had told him that that's all nonsense. But it was the, he, he plays off of the, um, it was the 17-year the cicada um, outbreak in that part of New Jersey, so he makes a song, and he sort of makes fun of universities, which, you know, he's always making fun of universities. I mean, universities are old folks' homes, um, and, you know, you can't live in a university, you can only die there, um, and it's desiccated, the old folks' home at the college, you know, I mean, you go through his early stuff, and it's just one thing, he's just making fun of, <laughs> it's pretty funny, too, actually. So, but, but Day of the Locusts is his most, you know, um, the benches were stained with tears and perspiration, the birdies were flying from tree to tree, it's all about, you know, you're just not living free. You're living in this place that's full of, of death. That Springsteen? Springsteen. Um, I don't know. I don't know that, 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 that I mean, Springsteen is certainly a follower of Bob Dylan's. I mean, when, when Bob Dylan turned 70 years old, um, someone asked Bruce Springsteen to comment, and he said, Bob Dylan is the father of my country, which I thought was pretty good. Um, man has a way with words. Um, but... Um, and you know, and they've played together a lot, and, and Dylan certainly understands about uh, 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 you know, where, where Springsteen's coming from. I mean, they're not the same by any means, um, but you know, they have a common sensibility, which I think they understand about each other. Um, I don't know that, um, I think that Dylan has, 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 has an extraordinary effect on, on, on Springsteen. I don't know that Springsteen's had a great effect on Dylan's work, uh, particularly, um, except for Tweeter and the Monkey Man on the Traveling Wilburys, where he's kind of making fun of well, he's kind of doing a, something of a, a respectful imitation parody of, of a Bruce Springsteen song. Um, um, you know, but I mean, he understands that they're two major guys in the culture, and they understand that. They're not rivals in any particular way, um, but, I, but, but, but they're, they're just you know, two major figures. Bob Miles, who was an undergraduate during that era, claims that he had something to do with convincing, he's a friend of uh, Dylan's, convincing him and I think that Dylan described Rudenstein as his head was exploding. Yes, exactly. And that he, he, Rudenstein was sent there because he was the youngest of the deans, and he I was see. supposed to be able to relate. I see. I see. Well, that, you know more than I do, Rick. But uh, it was it was quite an afternoon. Um, uh, David Crosby was along for the ride, and he said some things. And it's, if you read Chronicles, it's there. I cannot repeat those words in church. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I was there. Huh? I was there for the honorary degree. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Oh, well, see, we have a lot of, you know, witnesses here. I wasn't around for any of this stuff, you know. <laughs> you guys should have, you, you guys write the books. I'll just, I'll write. anyway, yes, sir. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, I'm very interested in Dylan's identity as a Midwesterner. 
mm -hmm. especially how it gets expressed through his relationships with um, people from Dinky Town and that Minneapolis scene, mm -hmm. and then uh, especially critics like Paul Nelson, mm -hmm. uh, who gets, I think, sort of a passing mention uh, in the Dylan in America mm -hmm. book. But I'd like to hear more about it from you, mm -hmm. if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, Dinky Town, Dinky Town is this, you know, for those of you who don't remember or don't know, is the sort, was a sort of bohemian um, student, folky district. I guess it's still, is it still? It is? So it's, you know, it's one of the, it's one of the clubs where the 10 o'clock scholar was one of the clubs. It was a pizza place called the Purple Onion that w they let the folk singers sing. Um, um, it was where, you know, that crowd hung out. And that crowd had some extraordinary people in it. People like Paul Nelson, John Pancake, um, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> Tony Glover, um, um, or Dave Glover, as he's really, his real name is, but Tony Little Son Glover, all of Colonel Ray and Glover there, you know, Spider John's there. Um, so it's quite a scene, and um, I mean he's still I think pretty pretty tight with Tony, um, um, but I think it, yeah I mean it was there that he really got immersed in folk music no question, and it's there that he's reading the beats for the first time too. Tony Glover told me a story where um, he says that you know there's a story that goes around that Dylan went to. to um, I think it was John, it was either John, it was John Pancake's house, and he stole a bunch of records, right? And uh, John, it's in the movie, and, and John goes after him with a bowling pin or something and wants to crack his head open. And he's, but he just said, well, I'm a, I'm a musical expeditionary, you know, I take what I want. That's his first example of love and theft, I guess. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, you know he's just taking the records, he's gonna, play, he's gonna keep them. Um, um, but, but, but in that whole world, oh, oh so, so Glover tells the story of, his, he lent, um, 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 he had gotten from Paris the, um, William Burroughs' novel, which in the, uh, the, it was published in Paris because no one published in the United States, and it was called the per Parisian uh, edition by Al the Olympia Press, um, was entitled The Naked Lunch. This is the French, you know, Le Déjeuner Déjeun Nu, or whatever it was. Um, and um, so you had to get it from Paris, and you had to hope that it cleared customs. You had a hope that the guy who was looking at it was an illiterate. And, you know, you'd get a number of guys who were not that literate. So they, they, they got, got through to Minneapolis. They got through to Nicky Town. And so, you know, Bob Dylan just kind of said, whoa, you know, what's that? You know, he wants to, you know, what's, what's that? You know. And so Tony Glover gives him a copy of the book, and he, he was careful to say, and he, two weeks later, he returned it. He gave it back to me. So he wasn't a total thief. Um, but, you know, that was a kind of... I mean, I don't want to, you know, put Minneapolis down, but it was a kind of, you know, triple A to what was going to happen in the village. And the village was boom. I mean, the village was gigantic. The village was huge. But that's where he passed through first. That's where he first bought, he put aside his electric guitar and picked up a, you know, a, a Martin acoustic. It's where he heard Odetta. It's where he got immersed in all of that stuff for the first time. He comes to New York off of what happened in Minneapolis because he was so turned on by Bound for, Bound for Glory and the Woody Guthrie records. So um, that scene was an extraordinary one. And, and understand, there is a larger story to this. I mean, I, I, I have a lot to say about New York because he comes to New York, and that was the world that I was in, so we talk about that. But there was stuff going on elsewhere in the, in the late 50s, early 60s, which often haven't been covered. Cambridge has been covered. That's one of the places. But all of these college towns had their own version of Dinky Town to them. So there was, a, there was a lot simmering out there in the late 50s. I think the 50s actually have been kind of maligned. Um, um, because at least by the end of the decade, they were, this stuff was all happening, in part to reaction, in reaction against things that were happening, you know, uh, the, the Eisenhower dullness, et cetera, maybe, but, but no, it was happening then. I mean, you know, On the Road was described something, that ha a trip that happened in 1947. It just happened to come out in 1957. So there was a lot more going on in these little towns, in these, in, these, in these college towns than people remember, and it ought to be remembered. There's a very good book that um, Eric Von Schmidt and Jim Rooney wrote about Cambridge, um, um, called uh, Baby Let Me Follow You Down, I think, isn't it? Yeah. And if you want to go back and learn what happened in these environs in the, in the 1960s, right through the Newport Folk Festival and the, all the rest of it, it's in there. Um, but Dinky Town was, was, was cool. And I hope it still is. Hi. Hi. I have a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. uh, could you say a few words about the whole controversy about uh, Dylan's performance in China? I remember reading um, either Maureen Dowd mm -hmm. or Gail Collin, Collins. Maureen Dowd, not, not Gail, I'm Maureen. Sorry, Maureen Dowd or, mm -hmm. or Gail Collins. Who wrote it? Was it Dowd? 
Yeah. Yeah, it was, to me it was devastating and I was hoping that Dylan would reply. I, I kind of disagree with you that an artist doesn't have to or shouldn't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think he would have, it would have been a wise thing to do, but I'd be real interested to hear your reaction and if you know what Dylan's reaction to that column was. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. my I do, yeah. yeah. And my second very uh, unrelated question has to do with the never ending tour. Mm -hmm. uh, what makes him tick? I mean, he lives in California, is that right? Uh, he has a house in California, yeah. I mean, where does he spend his non-touring time? Right, right. How much time does he spend there over the right. course of a year? And is he married? I mean, what, what's right. going on with his life? I'd be fascinated right. to know. Okay. So thank you. Okay. I'll, I'll answer as much of that as I can. Um, first on the, the China thing, um, Bob Dylan went to China last spring in April and it was, uh, gave concerts there and in Vietnam. And actually all the hype was about the Vietnam concerts because he was gonna be in, in, in Ho Chi Minh City. And so, you know, 60s, Saigon, return, blah, blah. But um, as soon as he arrived in, 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 in Beijing, a, a number of pundits, including the, ones you, the one you mentioned, um, got on his case very, very hard saying that um, here was Bob Dylan, the, the great protest singer of the 60s, who's going to be um, caro um, um, crooning for the butchers of Beijing. You know, and he's submitting to, to censorship, and they're not gonna allow him to sing songs that are dangerous, that are going to be um, deemed to be politically incorrect by their viewpoint, and that Bob Dylan is a sellout. And that he's um, allowing himself to be censored, and, um, um, but he's gonna take the money and run. And he's just a, he's just a schnook. I think that basically summarizes the argument. Is that correct? Very good. Um, my response to that is that they, everybody got their facts wrong, first of all. And oh, and by the way, Dylan has responded to this. It's on his website. If you go to his website, I think it's still up um, on www.bobdylan.com. Um, he actually, he got so sick of it, I think he actually just did respond to it. And, and that's fair enough, because it, there was a lot of brouhaha. Um, here's the story. If you go to China and you want to um, perform, you have to submit to various government regulations. Any artist who wants to perform in China has to do that, okay? They involve your submitting a list of songs that you might perform to the government ahead of time. The government can then either say, no, you can't do that, or the government can say nothing or whatever. But that's the rule, that's the name of the game. If you're going to go there, that's what you have to submit to. Now. There's an argument to be made that no artist should do that, right? That no artist should go to China because, you know, it's just intolerable to have to, you know, give one single iota. It's sort of an absolutist free speech argument, right? That, that you know, you cannot, you know, under no circumstances are you going to bend on that issue about submitting anything to any government about anything. That's, that's a, and that's a perfectly respectable position, I think. You know, it's an honorable position. I think it's debatable, though. I think there's, a, there's, a, there's another point of view which says, look, if I go there, I can submit them there, that list. If that's the price of my going there, right, to do this, I will submit my list and then see what happens. And then see what happens. And, you know, if they say you can't do this and you can't do that and you can't do the other thing, well, then I can, maybe I don't have to go. But if I can go and then I can sing anything I want, well, it, maybe it's worth it to get my songs and be able to do my performance in this particular place, right? And I can do so with my conscience intact. That's a less than absolutist position. I can see you don't agree, but. <laughs> Go ahead, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, but but, but let, me let me finish while you're coming up, and then, no, no, come on up, come on up, and then I'll finish my, my argument, and then we may have a little debate. Um, and what happened in Dylan's case was, he basically came up, he, he submitted all of his song lists for the previous three months. Um, and um, what happened was nothing. Nothing happened. So he came out and sang whatever he wanted to sing. Um, and he actually opened, I was going to bring it tonight, but I didn't, I forgot to bring it along. He happened with God to, God to Serve Somebody. He didn't sing the songs that people wanted him to sing, expected him to sing. But he wasn't planning on singing them anyway. There is, they, they haven't been, he, you know, he hasn't sung Hurricane since 1975. He hasn't sung, you know, he sings the times they are changing much, but hasn't been on set. He sang the songs that he wanted to sing. 
There was not, not a peep came from the, from the, um, from, from the, uh, the, the, the Chinese government about what he could do and what he couldn't do. That was made up by the pundits. That was all made up. The idea that he had wanted to sing X, Y, Z, and then was disallowed from singing X, Y, Z, or that he sang to a, to a, a song list that was prescribed by the Chinese government, which some people were saying on, this is on the web, and Maureen doesn't say this, but it's said on the web. Because once a story gets out there, once a sort of scandal gets out there, there's all sorts of versions of it. That's totally untrue. So, you know, we could, we could have a very interesting argument about whether he should go or not, right? Um, in which case, no artist should go. And then every artist should be blasted. Um, why Bob Dylan, however, is the one that's selected to be blasted for having gone and sang what he sang and then have stories made up about him that were untrue about his not performing songs that the Chinese government would not allow him to do, I, find, I found that outrageous. And I said so in the New Yorker magazine. And you can go check it out. <laughs> it's on the web. Um, so, but now, please. Yeah. Well, you answered a lot of the things that I just didn't know. Uh, mm -hmm. as far as background, but um, I, I would say that I'm very disappointed that he uh, chose not to even submit or even be inclined to singing some of the songs that, you know, some of his most political songs. Oh, well, what are you I, saying? I mean, that all depends on what you mean by political. I, got, I said something that was foolish in my response. I'm not, not just now in The New Yorker, where I said that he's uncensorable, which is kind of Orwellian. I don't, I don't mean he's uncensorable. Of course he's, he's censorable. But the songs that he sings... I mean, when you sing A Hard Rain's Gonna Fall, as he did, where the pellets of poison are flooding their waters, et cetera, when you sing Gotta Serve Somebody, which is all about, you know, Jesus is coming, you're singing that in China, he's coming back to gather his jewels, he plays by the golden rule, whoever's got the gold rules, that's a, you know, that's not a mild song to be singing in Beijing. What else did he sing that you think? Oh, about? I have to go through the set list. But I mean, I, I actually had, I was going to bring the concert along. I have, I have, I have a, a tape of it. Um, okay. You know, it's, it's go, you can find the song list. Um, I think it's on BobDylan.com as well. So if you want to see what songs he sang, he sang, you know, a, a whole array of things. But there was some edgy, there's some edgy material on there. He didn't sing the times they are changing. But then again, I say, you know, come senators, congressmen, please heed the call. The Chinese might get really riled by that if they could figure out what a senator or congressman was. <laughs> no, actually, they probably know what a senator or congressman is. But you know what I'm saying? I mean, come on. Or he could sing, he could have sung the, 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 you know, the Lonesome Death of Hattie Carroll, which is probably his greatest protest song of all from that period. And, you know, what? You know, it wouldn't have made much sense. So, you know, singing, but singing got a certain, not so got a certain, um, I'm going to change my way of thinking. That's the song that he sang. Um, it's pretty heavy. And that's his first song. And he sings it with real bite and real, you know, the band was going. So, you know, I, I can see why people are on nerve, but I think that you have to be consistent. And, you know, then, you, then Nine Inch Nails can't go and Eric Clapton can't go and every other group that goes. Yeah. But then you also completely, you know, put a cordial sanitaire around China, yeah. which is clamped down a lot anyway, but still stuff gets through. And I, I'm all for stuff getting through. Could, could you also just say something about the never-ending tour? The other thing oh, the never-ending tour. Oh, yeah. I, I, think, I get the impression he doesn't like to go home a lot. I get the impression he doesn't like to be home a very, very much. Um, he's on the bus a lot. I think he's like Hank, you know, he thinks of himself as Hank Williams. If he can die like Hank Williams did on tour, that's probably a good thing. No. He is a pro. He is going to be on tour. That's what he does. With Bob Dylan, it's not just about the records, it's about the performances. He, he, he says he's mortified when he goes on stage, but he still does it. This is what he does. This is his art. It's on stage. He's a performing artist. He's not going to not perform if he can perform. And through thick and thin with Bob Dylan, um, since he recovered you know, from, the, from the accident in 1966, and since he's been on the road, really since the late 70s, he's never really stopped because that's his art as much as anything else is. And I think you have to understand Dylan that way as a performing artist rather than as a recording artist. He is a Columbia artist, you know, was a Columbia Records recording artist, yes. But he's also Bob Dylan, the performer, and that's part of his art, and that's never going to stop, even as his voice gets croaked. Um, no comment. And that gets edited out of the tape. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, I had been going to ask about China as well, so that's wonderful. I'd be interested to know if his songs are available and if you know whether they're listened to and how they're received in the country. 
Um, but I also had a second question, which is I was sitting around with a bunch of people a while back, not musical people, none of us including me, playing one of those parlor games where you write down quickly the 15 writers who have influenced you the most. And everyone was sharing their list, and someone had put Dylan at the end, and everyone else in the room said, oh, right, Bob Dylan had to be on the list. Mm -hmm. And so I wondered if you wanted to talk about his influence as a literary influence and whether writers have drawn on him or how you've seen him playing out mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. that side of the world. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, well, I thank you. That's a good question. I mean, I think that, you know, the, the, there are more novels that come out in the last 10, 15 years with Dylan lines as their titles. You know, Yonder Stands Your Orphan. Um, you know, that wouldn't have come to somebody without, you know, um, Baby Blue. Um, you know, there's a bunch of them. So I think Dylan's had a profound, he's had a profound impact on the literary sensibilities of, of my generation and every generation that followed. And I'm 10 years younger than Bob Dylan. Um, you can't have, I mean, for a lot, a lot of people, their, their first serious engagement with words was listening to Bob Dylan songs. It wasn't reading Yeats. One hopes they move on to read Yeats um, 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 or whatever. Um, but, but no, I think, it's, I think it's been profound. And I think he collapsed um, um, barriers between high and low in ways that American culture has always tried to do. I mean, the minstrels try to do that, but he's, he has done it in a different way. Um, he has shown that, I mean, he's funny. Allen Ginsberg once said that Bob Dylan proved that you can put poetry on the jukebox, right? To which Bob Dylan responded, no, Hank Williams proved that. You see, so so it's a double, it's a double, double, double whammy on all of that. I mean, yes, what is poetry? You know, um, not so much jambalaya, but um, your cheating heart that gets that says a lot in a very few words, which is what poetry is supposed to do. Uh, I had a couple of concluding questions. Yeah. Uh, we've we've you've mentioned it, but and I love the way you discussed his book Chronicle because I think a lot of people were taken by surprise at, after you know, so much of the darkness and the mystery of, of Dylan that the book was so open-hearted and, and was so gracious and everything, although I, I do know that some people like Dave Van Ronk were, you know, he was so effusive in his praise of, of Dave Van Ronk and Dave did say to more than one person, uh, yeah, now he tells us. But I wonder if, if, if you know what's behind this. There has, it, it's been a remarkable transformation in Dylan's relationship with the music and the outside world in that he's become such an elder lately and yeah. so wide open. I mean, if you were drinking with him like Allen Ginsberg, you might hear that about Hank Williams, but you didn't hear it from the stage or in his public persona much. Now he's become a real, you know, he really wants people to know all of the influences that shaped his music, and he wants people to hear the great traditional masters and the great blues guys and right. the great early pop guys. You know, he, he, he personally produced and, and compiled a brilliant anthology tribute to Jimmy Rogers, right. the father of country music, right. which is something that it, it, would, it would seem almost unthinkable to imagine him right. doing in the 60s or 70s. Right. What is it about him that has changed as he's become an elder, that he's taken on that mantle of sort of amb ambassador of American right. roots music? Right. He now, I'm just a little, a little plug, he, the Egyptian Records, which is a record company, has just released another one of these called the Lost, uh, it's called Hank Williams, The Lost Notebooks. And basically, when Hank Williams died, he left behind a couple of notebooks uh, with just lyrics. So he started, he wrote the first, but everybody from Jack White to, you know, um, um, Vince Gill and Rodney Crowell, so it's Nashville stuff, but uh, um, a, a whole array of artists have recorded their own versions of these, of their songs put to his lyrics, which is great. Um, having, turning 70 has something to do with it, getting older has something to do with it, but I do think that Dylan thinks he's the last person out there. There are not going to be any more people like him when, he, when he's gone. Mm -hmm. And I fear that that's sort of true. I mean, if you read the liner notes to, to that, that album I mentioned earlier, to um, World Gone Wrong, from which Lone Pilgrim is taken from, um, he has a line about, it's either about Delia or it's about um, um, that song, I can't remember which, in which he says, you know, if, you know virtual reality is taking over. These, no one's writing these songs anymore. They can't. Um, so I do think that he thinks of himself as, it's not that there are other people he admires or he likes to play with or hang out with, of course there are. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I do think that he has a, a certain, what, um, 
passion, certainly. I wouldn't say mission, but I think it's an idea that's become much more urgent to him as the world has changed around him. Mm. Um, you know, the world of the 1960s was <laughs> very different than the world we're living in now. And I think he sees both the, the he's something of a technophobe. Um, um, the, the, the way that records are made. You know, he likes to go into the studio, have an old microphone and just play. Um, now, that's not the way records are made anymore. Um, so music, the spontaneity, the sense of, everything's gotten just phonier. Um, it's a word that he and Lenny Bruce used to use all the time, and call phony, or, or J.D. Salinger. It's a real 50s, 60s word, phony, phony, phony. Well, everything is really phony. Um, so he's trying to keep alive, you know, not authenticity in the narrow sense, but something that is um, more humane and more and, 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 and open to art in a way that popular music just doesn't have that much of anymore. And finally, uh, ask you to, to speak to the inscrutable and ever elusive Sean Wilentz a little. Um, you, you mentioned your, uh, your early fascination with Dylan in terms of geographical proximity and, yeah. uh, and growing up the same culture, but yeah. to, have, to have put what you've put into something like Bob Dylan in America and the, and the other things that you've done about Dylan, I'm wondering what you personally, what is it that moves you so much about Bob Dylan's art that you have made it such an important part of your life? That's a big question, Scott. Well, I, mean, I, I suppose that's a question that could be asked of many, many people here. Um, um, but not everybody here is a historian. Um, so I think that, that, that it, it, it hit home when I, st and actually when I started writing about his stuff in the late 90s and, and then doing the, the liner notes to, well, the, the, the web stuff on, on Love and Theft, where the historical aspects of what he did became clearer to me. Mm -hmm. And I think it was the intersection there that made, you know, this is very much a historian's book. I mean, it's not a, it's not a biography. It's not a um, musicological book. It's a book about America. And, um, you know, I think about what America is every minute of the day. Mm. Um, um, well, there are some minutes of the day I don't. But, um, but I think about it a lot. And, um, and I actually know a lot about it, too. So um, between knowing things that, that maybe other people don't um, or that other people don't, um, but, that, but then seeing that in that body of work, which everybody knows, and trying to put it together became, you know, a... a you know, ext extremely entertaining and uh, wonderf wonderful uh, um, exercise. But I do think that Dylan is a, is a you know, is, 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 is acutely aware, has an acute historical consciousness, um, which, you know, most, most, most singers don't. Most, you know, they, they, have a, they have a, how to put it, um, they have maybe an archival consciousness or they have um, an awareness that things go back in, in time, and maybe this is really related to this, that, and the other thing. But he has a profound historical consciousness. I mean, he thinks about history in ways that are um, um, very, very deep and very, very strong, especially the history of the United States. I mean, you read his description of the Civil War and what the Civil War meant to this country and its culture, which is basically about a country that's being nailed to the crucifix and then is redeemed, um, but sort of redeemed. Um, it, that's his bad, he's thought about that a lot. Mm -hmm. um, he's not just throwing those words up to, to sound good. So I think that that's what, that, that more than anything is what got me. Um, that's a very long-winded answer to your question. Oh, no, but everybody loves Bob Dylan, so, you know, or not everybody, but a lot of people do for their own reasons. Mm -hmm. And that's, I just said, this is mine. Um, yeah. But, you know, other people have, have their own, you know, he's changed more people's lives, I think, than any other, um, 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 you know, artists to come out of the United States, certainly, um, um, of, of, f from the last 50 years. Mm -hmm. So that's awesome. pretty good. That was a great answer. Thank you, Sean Wilentz. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Great to be back. And thank you, Scott. Thank you very much. You have been listening to a program of Cambridge Forum, recorded in October 2011, co-sponsored by the First Parish in Cambridge, the Lowell Institute, and the Friends of Cambridge Forum. For a CD of this forum entitled Bob Dylan in America, featuring Sean Wilentz, or for additional information about our ongoing radio series and our forum network webcasts, visit us on the web at cambridgeforum.org. In Harvard Square, I'm Scott Alaric. Thanks to all of you for joining us.